This is the third day of the July 94 seven day retreat in Springwater. There are so many questions. Maybe the first one is how do I deal with pain during sitting? One may never have been to a retreat before where one has sat for several hours a day. And I hope it is understood by everyone that there is no requirement to do this. And yet one sees other people sitting for hours. And that seems what one does here. And it is also something to experiment with. To sit quietly. For extended periods of time. In between quiet walking or resting quiet eating, quiet working, but it is particularly during the sitting motionlessly that pains manifest. And most of the time, by the time one gets up, the pain is not there. At least that is what has been reported by the people who have brought up the question of pain. So it is nothing that needs to be known. One has a persistent pain, walking, sitting, working, getting worse. And, uh, and, and the worry is there, what is this pain? And one takes it to a doctor, a chiropractor, or osteopath, homeopath. to see whether something can be done to it from the outside, medicine, manipulation, whatever all the things are uh, that are done, physical therapy, to, to alleviate or help with physical pain in the back, in the hips, knees, shoulders, neck, whatever manifests in a sitting. It can also be organ, the heart may ache, the stomach or intestines. So no one says ignore your pain if it is persistent and, and beckons to be examined closer and further. But if it is a pain that comes while one is sitting and is gone when one is getting up, and yet one doesn't want to get up in the middle of a round. We have sort of made some kind of commitment to keep it quiet for each other because it is very helpful, particularly in certain phases or states of sitting, not to have a lot of commotion around one because it immediately arouses thought and thought arouses associations and associations uh, connect with feelings and emotions in the body. It's very hard then to sit quietly and listen without being all engaged and involved in, in something. We'll come back to that too later. So not getting up, the pain is there, the back, the hips, knee or neck, shoulders, headache, one person said. What is one to do about it? Just before pulling the, the right leg up to, to the back of this chair, I felt a cramp in my, in my upper thigh, which I get every once in a while. 
And that reminded me of the days when I went to the very beginning days of going to a Zen center where you had to sit quietly and do all the sittings. I thought, what if I get that cramp in my upper thigh? What will I do? Because up till then, whenever that thing appeared, I would get up and dance, hop on it. I don't mean uh, ballroom dancing. Hop around, do something. I didn't really know what to do with it, but I had to do something that was clear to me at the time. Here, waiting for a moment, the cramp didn't get, go away, so I just let it cramp. I've learned that. That it's all right to have something painful happen without doing anything about it other than being aware of it in the simplest of ways. The simplest of ways is not even concentrating on it, but allowing it to do its thing in the presence, in the presence. Aware, here, with the wind, in the leaves and, and branches. Sometimes the house creaking or window rattling, birds singing, heart beating, breath flowing in and out. And this is there too. It's not here now because that's what happens to a lot of the pains that we're worried about or feel they are so hard to deal with. They come and go like everything else on their own if the body is at ease with paining moments or phases. And by the body being at ease with a paining moment or paining leg, hip, back, neck, at ease meanings not responding to worrisome thought about it. Because the moment there's worry about it, I shouldn't have this, or will this get worse? I'm sure it will get worse because it always has gotten worse in the back. So go the thoughts. And the body that we called yesterday the most faithful of accompanists will accompany every one of those thoughts. A fearful thought and the body responds with a fearful reaction, which is very complex. One of the aspects is to brace against pain. Stiffen muscles, tendons against feeling pain. We've learned it somewhere. Or maybe there's something inherent in the body when one breaks a bone, the body at that particular place or over an area stiffens. So before even a plaster cast is put around, the body has already done something to keep that broken spot alone. And it does that by stiffening and bracing around it. And somehow or other, this is transferred to also to other pains which may not need that bracing. Also, a pain manifesting right now has associative memories of the past. Maybe not just of this pain, but of aching, of hurting. And the body and thought responds to present remembered pain just as it did at the time. It does not differentiate between memory and the direct acute incident now. It just brings its same mechanisms to bear. So a fearful thought makes the organs do all kinds of things which are appropriate for true danger, to run or to fight, to be paralyzed, to freeze, like sometimes little caterpillars do. You, you touch them and they freeze. And I've seen in a 
in a documentary movie that many birds don't touch these frozen-looking caterpillars because they appear dead. They don't want dead food. So this is still programmed into this organism to run, to fight, or to freeze, to make oneself unpalatable to the predator. So all kind of reactions which come with the concept or the thought, I, am, I have pain, add and complicate this pain. The resistance against it complicates it. Just like uh, one has found out that childbirth with resistance and therefore ether and doing this thing with a lot of force and violence on the part of uh, the ones who think they're aiding in the birth is not as good as this natural childbirth where the woman flows with the pain and doesn't think of it as pain, has learned to, to, to see it as something different, as something helpful, necessary, and not to be braced against or avoided, but moving with it or letting it do its thing. So, as pain manifests, can one watch, has one already labeled it pain, there's already a thought running, oh, I've got this pain again. And then, in noticing the labeling, is it possible to let the label go and say, what is this really without a label? One can't prevent labeling often. It's not necessary to do it. It can be perception without it. But most of the time, particularly as one is beginning with this kind of work, the label is there as quickly as the perception is there. This is this, this is that. Or what is it? And, and scanning for a label. Because labels have given us some kind of security in thinking we know what this is. Sort of a pseudo-security. So is it possible now, when the word pain comes up and one listens to one's commentary, which we talked about yesterday, and we were doing it, listening to the storyline, to realize that in going with the label and the reaction, one isn't with this thing that one is labeling and reacting to, with the actual acute happening, which isn't a word, it isn't a thought, it isn't the memory, it's here, right now. What is it? In asking in that wise, there's a, a learning that knowing more about it is no help in being in a direct, intimate touch with it. One learns the difference between thinking about something and truly experiencing it without comment. The comment is already a step away again into possibly more discomfort. Because as people have mentioned, I get afraid, I get even panicky about some pains. And panic is contraction and all kinds of physical manifestations which are originally meant for running as fast as we can, mobilizing all this energy to get away from danger. And if there's the mobilization of energy going, going on, muscles being readied for running, jumping, and that doesn't happen. We don't run, we don't jump, and it's very discomfort, uncomfortable to sit with all this stuff that the glands and organs and muscles are carrying out. At, one point, at what point can there be a stopping, looking and listening and experiencing what is actually there with interest, not with fear? Fear comes if we think this is something dangerous 
or something that's going to get worse, but that is assumption. One really believes it's dangerous when goes to a doctor. We have a brand new van. Somebody can drive us there to the clinic. Air condition. <laughs> but not, not one person has felt that this was anything to, to worry about, but one wants to know how to deal with this. And it's so simple. It's so simple that we've overlooked it all our life. Maybe not in the very beginning. Because unless they have been fussed over a lot, children can, when they fall, or, uh, or may, they may already have taken over the, the, fr the fright of the parent. It's amazing to me how quickly they can forget their sickness, their fever, their aches, and run around because they're interested in the world. Think and cogitate about a pain that has happened. Maybe at the moment there's crying and after been hugged and kissed away that they run again. But for us, the thought lingers about our pains and bruises and cuts and aches and adds to it. So the, the simplest of ways is to be there doing nothing. Doing nothing, but awareness is operating. Awareness is never a doing. There's no doer in awareness. No doer. No achiever of awareness. Awareness comes on its own. And whatever is going on inside and outside this organism, as long as it's even felt like inside and outside, appears in awareness as it is. And a label is noticed in awareness and need not obscure what's going on if one is aware that it has a tendency to do that, labeling, reacting. We went through that. So a sort of a silent, still question, what is this? And listening, all of this whole organism, one listening, one experiencing, one being, with no need to narrow down into doing this or that. Then we will find out most of the time that this pain or ache is not what we thought it was. It's something different and it may even have gone away before we know it. Maybe later we remember, oh, I had this pain. Where did it go? If it's still there, I don't want to suggest magic. Well, sometimes it is like magic when there's no division, just awareness without division. things appear in a new way, which is maybe the only magic there is. Awareness without doing, without knowing, without fearing. Because fear that comes up is seen and is allowed to manifest without separation. Then where does it go? What happens? Find out. Try it. Experiment with it. Experimenting meaning, subtle, a subtle noticing of the subtle resistances which are there. Some of them are gross and can be seen and don't need to operate, but some are very subtle. I, I don't want this. 
this is a disturbance right now. If only this wasn't going on, I would be fully aware. These are all resisting thoughts which manifest also physically. So what is, what is resistance if it is felt? Can the word drop off? I'm using it because we're talking with each other. But in feeling a bracing, a not wanting, a wanting to run, what is it? Not just verbalize it and say, I know it, but come back to the actual and feel it operating without knowing what it is. So that bit by bit or all in one, the resistance and separation is gone. There's only wind blowing. Breath flowing. Heart beating. Sensations here, 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 wherever. We feel them because we're alive. We have a pain because we're alive to feel it. Which brings to mind, sometimes people tell me that in the beginning of doing this quiet sitting, they are so numb that they don't feel anything, don't feel their bodies. There was a woman who came to several retreats here. After the first retreat, or during, maybe during a meeting, I don't know when it was, I asked, how are you doing? How does your body take this? She says, I feel nothing. An older woman, sitting all around, she said, I don't, I don't feel anything. And little by little, over time, did she realize that the body does have aches, but it had numbed itself for whatever reasons of development in the past, whatever all happened. Maybe unbearable pain being repressed or blocked out. The body had gotten numb. And with the awakening of aliveness, there was, the first thing that felt was pain. She didn't complain about it. She said, it feels wonderful to feel, feel something. And I guessed how little sensation there was in the body. And yet keenly interested to see what else there was. All her life she hadn't felt. So very likely, the first thing to a numbed organism is the feeling of pain. When it comes to life, begins to wake up from the sleep of anesthesis or anesthesia, blocking, repressing. Now, for one person, it was a joy to feel something. For some else, someone else, it may be frightening to feel pain. So to listen to the fear, to, what, to all that's going on in a non-separating way, which is not running away from it, and hear the voices say, I got to be rid of it and not go with it. Maybe if this wasn't clear, we, we can bring it up in group and in individual meetings. Next thing that comes to mind was a persistent question yesterday in a group meeting about attachment. 
What is attachment? Or is this attachment when I'm like that? Person brought up the, the love for a house that one lives in, the love for the house one used to live in, that it sort of takes on one's character, particularly if one is interested in decor decorating it. And the, all the memories that hang in there. And then leaving, leaving that house, is there pain? I have to leave it. I don't want to leave it. How can I leave it? I'll never find a place like this again. Already before one has left, the thought of the pain of leaving it. Like, like losing a friend, losing one's house. A person was asking, is that attachment? Because it's just putting another word on something that has already been quite accurately described. Thinking about it as my house, my home, my extended body. I may not put it in those words, but that's the feeling, the experience. And there is, isn't there, attachment to this body, which we call our own, and all that it has created around itself, its belongings, its decorations, its clothes, the people one has become linked with, one's family, husband, wife, children, or companions, friends. We call that process identification. Meaning, my house is just like me. It's me. It's mine. If I have to lose it, it's like losing part of my body. And the fear of that, and the ache of it, when it happens, and in questioning it, the person said, it does have a lot to do with memories. It does. Because if one moves from a house into a new house and don't, doesn't remember the old house and just begins decorating the new one. There's no, no ache in thinking. One doesn't think of the old one and therefore one doesn't ache. Comes to mind right now, we used to, for three years after leaving the Zen Center, we rented a camp on Lake Canandaigua, which is one of the most beautiful finger lakes has quite high mountains, and we, the camp we were renting sort of jutted out on a land tongue, so even though there are lots of houses and people living there, from that tongue of land that one could step into, one hardly saw any neighbors. There were beautiful trees, and on the other side of the road there were woods and a creek running into the lake and standing at that mouth of the creek where it empties into the lake was a marvel to behold all seasons. In the winter time when the lake started freezing, you would literally hear the freezing. It was amazing. I'd never experienced water in such proximity because in a retreat one is so sensitive, so open. There's some time to look and listen geese landing on it on their flight on. And then in the spring, the sounds of cracking again as the lake was melting. Lots of people spending time at the lake or watching that creek, which was ever changing. It was never the same from one season to another. Emptying into this beautiful blue lake. And when we found this land, I wondered, won't we miss Lake Canandaigua? Have we gotten attached to it, to the beauty of, and all the happenings there that one could really live with, the change of seasons and so forth? And to my amazement, really, I never missed it. When once we were here, I wonder, wondered why don't I miss it? And it was because I didn't think of it. Didn't think back. 
how wonderful the lake was because now here is this because it wasn't a bad trade <laughs> <laughs> but quite apart from that it became very clear that what we call attachment is the compulsion to keep thinking and remembering or anticipating the loss identification is to make this part of the idea of oneself which is just idea, it's just mental machinations with imagery. And then the addiction to the good feelings that memories bring. Memories of good times, memories of bad times don't bring good feelings, bring sad feelings. So the, the, the question that was brought up yesterday when I if I were to stand in the field of human beings and there someplace was my husband and my three children. They, they, they mean something special to me. There's a, an instant recognition of them and a feeling. Is that attachment that was the question? Well, why call it anything? Let's first examine what goes on. without labeling it so that there can be lucidity, clarity in what the mind projects. These, this is my husband, my wife, my children. Aren't they beautiful the way they stand out in this field of people? This may be one train of thought, maybe others. I belong to them, they belong to me. It's my family. Such thoughts create this feeling of identity, what is me beyond my body. It seems to be a very habitual attachment to that which we call our own. My furniture, my house, we went through that. My job, if one is very happy with one's job, or at least if one mentions it to others, one notices people's eyes opening up a little bit in recognition and admiration or, rec or how, how do we say, approval, or appreciation, respect. So I'm identified with my job. I'm not. Personally, I'm not. I, I don't think of it that way. But it's, all, it's altogether conceivable that one is identified with one's job as an engineer, technician, Nobel Prize winner, whatever, doctor, lawyer. Identified meaning, I like to think of myself in this way because it gives me good feelings and it earns me the respect of other people, which also gives me good feelings. I can see that respect, the way people treat me after I've told them I'm a lawyer. They act all of a sudden a little bit differently than before. Than if I said I was a cleaning lady. So, is one attached, one has to watch what is going on and not get stuck with a label. Maybe the only time we really find out whether we are attached or not is when we lose what we consider to be our own with which we identify. Remember at the time, the memory of the Zen Center comes up again. In making known that I was going to leave and maybe work in a different environment, we called it at the time an empty room meaning empty of uh, ritual objects or altar. Some people got very angry with me about this, very sad. Some others very sad. One woman cried outright for abandoning. 
something so sacred, so beautiful, so helpful. And over the years, the center had just existed for 15 years or so. There was a constant reminder. There was nothing to be attached to. Buddha, altars, nothing to be attached to. It was just a way of, I don't know what, what the rationale for it was given, but it was always said, don't be attached to it. You need not be attached to it. Burn the Buddha. Saying, if I meet the Buddha, I'll slay him, or I'll throw the figure into the fire. And here, one person saying, I'm leaving this, and all the pain, all the anger and crying. Is that attachment? One doesn't realize that it happens and how it happens until it's called into question, or somebody walks away from it. Then we realize how strong the identification is. It's me. I am being denied. Or what I call my own, my sacred field, or my mundane field. But until it happens, one can easily protest that one is not attached. The implication in the questions yesterday was, <coughs> could I be doing what I'm doing, living with my husband, family in a house, without attachment? And is attachment sort of bad? That's wrong. When, when, once I'm attached, I've gone <coughs> off the right path. Maybe one hears talk like this one, in this way, like a warning against identification or attachment. And then the mind sets up the injunction, don't be attached, and one cannot look at what's happening. Because one already thinks this is bad. And if there is an image in the mind of something being wrong or bad, it hides what is actually happening from view. So, no matter how emphatic or passionate I may be talking, not condemning. Please, if you feel that I am, bring it up with me. We'll look at it. I'll look at it too. Maybe I was. So, condemnation is another darkening of the view. But to, to find out, to look at attachment, constantly remembering this, constantly bringing up an idea of what I will be and uh, sort of milking the good energies that comes from that thought of what I will be, that is perceivable on the inner screen, if it were. One can become very transparent to oneself in this work of listening and looking, inwardly and outwardly. Transparent to the thought and image making and their connections with the organs and glands and emotions. and even the, the addictiveness to it, to, to, to feel that again and therefore remembering again or anticipating again just to feel this swelling of energy. All it needs to be is discovered and observed in a non-judging awareness.
which has its own inbuilt wisdom. Inbuilt is not a good word because there's nothing mechanical or constructed about awareness. It's just lightening, illuminating what's there. And in, in watching it in a light way is wisdom unfolding about what we call ourselves and each other. I won't go into this question full-blown today. It's not enough time. What is myself? It's coming up all the time in meetings. What am I really? One person had picked up something I said that I'm not this body and, and mind, or am I this body and mind? Is that all I am? And the person said, well, if I'm not if I'm not this body in mind, in mind, if this is not my body, how then would I take care of it? And shouldn't I take care, intelligent care of it? Again, the implication being, unless I call it my own, I won't care. And this is maybe how we have grown to be, by imitation and example. Take care of your possessions. Never mind other people's possessions. And we're not told this way, but the emphasis on our own possessions leaves almost no time and energy to, to take care of someone else's. Throw the beer can on someone else's front lawn. <laughs> thinking of dogs too, but I won't go into it. <laughs> so, let's drop the assumption that the only good intelligent care that can emerge from this organism is when the thought calls it my own. Let's drop the assumption. Maybe true, maybe not, but I'll watch whether it's possible to take intelligent care of this organism or whoever I, am, I happen to be with without calling it my own, without identifying with it. Is it possible not to identify with this body? This is the first question again, isn't it? Because we are so deeply identified with it because we talk about it all the time. It's me, it's mine. Yet with a diminishing of thoughts about oneself, it seems to emerge much more clearly what needs to be done to stay healthy. Although a lot of it is happens very spontaneously, automatically, totally outside of anyone's control. But in experimenting, one may find that exercising, getting, getting proper sleep, rest, watching the input of food, not, not to overeat or overeat information, information professionally or entertaining newspapers, novels, books. We can so OD on it, or maybe we don't even notice that we do. And then the next day there's a hangover, a headache, or ill feeling. And to, to find quiet time is an intelligent care of this organism. which gets so wasted away or worn by constantly running here and there and there and there, 
constantly worry, constantly active. And so out of touch with a quiet, not non-doing, but as, as it is sort of scheduled in a bit into one's daily life, one notices things, the increased sensitivity and awareness to what is happening, and with that, again, the intelligence of what is conducive to wholesome living. Without making precepts out of it, then we become very mechanical again and compulsive, and not sensitively aware and wise So would I care for others if I don't consider them my own? Or maybe we can turn it around. Maybe everyone and everything is my own. Not in the conceptual way, but truly, actually, no division. Division which is created through these thoughts of me and mine and the reconfirmation through the way we all talk and act on the basis of these thoughts I've been doing so for thousands of years. But who or what am I with all, without all of these thoughts about me and mine? Not that bad. I got to get rid of them. I'm asking an experimental question. It's maybe then when these thoughts slow down, quiet down, and sort of revolving around oneself like a cocoon. The thoughts, me, mine, my attachments, so the slowing of those thoughts, the quieting down of them. Maybe then there is an awakening of love and caring, which one has never known before. It doesn't come from taking precepts to be loving or compassionate. It's there when the cocoon is open. We will end here for today. 